welcome everyone and I just want to ask you before we get going is what can you do to make yourself feel more comfortable right now whatever that might be that might be itching your nose opening the window hitting the floor grabbing a blanket whatever getting the cat getting the dog cats and dogs are more than welcome um I'm sure we'd love to see them this morning um so what can you do to make yourself feel more comfortable right now and I'd encourage you to do that and just taking your attention to within that feeling comfortable, how can you feel a little bit more steady? Maybe in contact with the earth, maybe wiggling your toes. And I'd invite you if possible to take your, well, I don't think you'll have shoes on, but maybe even your socks off, depending if the house is warmed up. Yeah, just to feel steady, feet on the ground for the day. And I wanna wel welcome you to this introduction to trauma sensitive yoga and this is part of the workshops I'm running around integrating the body in therapy and before we start I want to just drop into a minute silence again with that um, grounded steady feeling just so we can just so we can arrive right now so I'm going to invite you into a minute silence from now And slowly coming back into the space. Maybe wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, let your lips have a swallow, whatever you need to do. Again, just to come back to that place of comfort today. And when we work with the body, as we're going to be doing today and discussing the body, it can bring up a lot for us as therapists. And when we're bringing maybe clients to mind, students to mind, um, people who are working with and it can bring up a lot of shame and anxiety for us and I really want to keep this work on us um, so just being aware of what compassion for yourself you might need to giving yourself choice um, and also there's it's been a hell of a week and we're all in lockdown um, apart from Charlotte in Australia I don't I, I don't know what's happening in Australia and um, so I just want you to take a moment um, just to be curious about, hang on, how am I feeling right now? It's Saturday morning. The world is going on with the pandemic. How am I feeling? Am I tired? Am I hungry? Where's my blood sugar? What do I need? And just checking in with your breath. Just checking in with your breath. Hmm. Okay. And the pace of today is quite hi and i get very excited about this subject because a few years ago nobody wanted to really speak about it and now I've, i'm on i wish we were all in a room together that's what i wish today um so let we're going to connect as much as we can um so stay with me there is a lot of information this is a three-hour introduction to probably about 25 years of knowledge that i'd love to work with you on and share with you so if there's something that does interest you please get a hold of it. I'm sending you lots of resources after the workshop. Follow it up. Follow that thing up that you're interested in because there's loads today. Okay. And this is just an introduction. So I'm going to encourage you to follow your interest and you'll see that again, I get super excited about it. So I'll be, you know, get, getting a bit, um, jumping about a bit and actually it's how, oh, okay. What's just notice what stays with you is a little bit of a diamond. OK, and we're all here today for our professional roles. And we've got a beautiful group today of energy with people who are psychotherapists, counsellors, 
yoga teachers, social workers, people working with the body, chiropodists, massage therapists, people working with energy, coaches. So in the middle of that is our clients, our interest. And right now, we need to look after ourselves, understand areas of working with the body because we need to be working with a lot of people for the next year. So we've the fact that you're interested in this right now is very, very important. So we all are not different coming to that middle space where our shared interest is working with the body. It's about healing and sharing tools with our clients and being safe. So it's a wonderful group of people and we've all got a lot in common, which is just lovely for me. So just to take a moment, um, our, because often our professional roles can block our thinking, a lot of it sort of cuts off from the mind body and I'd like you to use your body as a vessel today and we will be doing movement and we will be doing thinking, but it's knowing where that cuts off. So just to really, it's a bit of an icebreaker and it's where I'm going to ask Zena for our help actually. Just to take a moment, to, if you can type this in the chat of something, let me just see if I can go on here. One thing that's made you smile this week. Just take a moment, if we can pop that in the chat and Zena, if you could play that back for us. I'm, I'm going to say, and you're welcome to say it actually, if you like, because I can't get on the chat because I'll be forward and backwards. I saw some daffodils the other day. I'm desperate for daffodils. And I saw the bulbs coming through in a park in the snow and that, I, it stopped me in my tracks. And actually I, I found some and they've come out overnight. I'm chuffed to bits, they're in the back. So that's mine. Zena, have we got any up? By all means, please unmute. One thing that made you smile. Me unmute, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you want to go back to the group view for this? Oh or, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep me right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So um, Alison saying nature, uh, Marie, uh, my cat in the snow, uh, Jenna, my friends, Rachel, snow, uh, Laura Snow, uh, Laura, birthday wishes. Is that, is that, does that mean it's your birthday, Laura? Is that a, yeah, happy birthday. <laughs> uh, lovely to spend your birthday with you, yeah. Um, Mandy memes that make light of things. Oh, I, I love that. I need that. <laughs> that. That really, I do need that. Um, Claire, catching snowflakes on my tongue. That was my four-year-old's daughter's homework yesterday, which is just amazing. Um, not homework, online work to do. Uh, Kate, hearing my daughter laugh, playing with our kitten. Um, I, don't, I, I know I'm going to get this wrong, sorry. Is it Pira? Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm looking to see if you, anyone's going to create. Yep, yep, brilliant. Uh, throwing ice in the garden. Uh, Leighton, watching kids, watching your kids dancing together. Danielle, the birds um, have now discovered the bird feeder that she's attached to the window of the third floor flats and watching the robins and the fin oh. come. It's lovely. Uh, Melanie, watching our rabbits. Katie, a cold walk with my dog. Lisa, playing with my eight-year-old son um, with Romans and Egyptians mobile figures. Uh, Sarah, my run yesterday morning. Had a rocky moment after running up hill. Um, after running up a hill. Um, Did I just see someone said about being swimming in the naked ICC? Have you jumped ahead? Maybe. I just saw someone say, there, Hannah, good for you. Hannah Brazil. Yeah, that is me. <laughs> Go on, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's <is> so great. <laughs> Brilliant, I bet that made you smile. Oh, goodness, fantastic. That was amazing. Um, yeah, more memes. I've lost, I'm, I've lost where I am now. <laughs> um, lots of snow, seeing family. Oh, my, um, Emma's saying her daughter who's recovering from cancer treatment, um, joining, joining her to do yoga. That was oh. lovely. Whew. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. We need that now. 
We need that now. Okay, great. So how the workshop's going to be broken down is, it's into three parts. So we're going to look at what is trauma sensitive yoga and who is it for? Um, well, and I'll give you some history around that. Uh, we're then going to look at the therapeutic, we'll take a, a movement break at 11.50 to move and breathe. We'll go into the therapeutic goals, the language and use of empowerment, and then in, take another break. And then the final part, a bit of theory, just a little bit. And then we're going to do some more practice as well. Okay, and just keeping an eye on our energy as we go through. And again, um, I want to really welcome the group um, and for mental health professionals, the aim here is for you to integrate, and I'm sure you're all, you wouldn't be on this workshop if you weren't already integrating the body somehow into your work, but to integrate some of these tools and have them in your toolbox into your current practice for yoga professionals, coaches, healing professionals, chiropodists, um, to help make your work more maybe trauma informed. So hopefully there'll be some knowledge in there for you and really it's around safety and this is especially important now um where we are with covid and the fear that really is in the collective unconscious and again when i say that i'd like you to connect with your steadiness feet on the ground so we can in order for us to do our work okay so we're gonna just step into now what is trauma sensitive yoga and you may notice um, as we go through the workshop, and I'd actually like you to notice who is coming to mind. So if possible, I'm, I would like to encourage you to write it down so you're not holding the person, you're not holding the person in your head. So who comes to mind? It may be a client or how somebody may have moved or an experience you had in a yoga class or with a patient. If you could write it down, that would be really useful really useful. So trauma sensitive yoga, we're going to just do a little bit of movement here now and we're going to we're going to bring some trauma sensitive yoga in so we don't think about it too much. So it's a drop the pen moment. So coming back into our bodies. So if you like, you could bring your fingertips to your shoulders, bringing your fingertips to your shoulders. Oh, and if, sorry to interrupt. Do you want to go full screen so people can see you? Got it. Thank you, Zena. Thank you, Zena. Okay. So making yourself as comfortable as you can, and if you can come to the edge of your seat, edge of your seat. And if you like, you could bring your fingertips to your shoulders and experiment with making some circles with your elbows. Circles with your elbows. Just focus on making circles with your elbows, just being curious about that. And notice that you can make the circles in either direction. You have choice. So you can continue in one direction with one arm in the other direction, then maybe in taking it the other way, taking it the other way. And maybe just being curious about any tension on the left side right side is one side different to the other it always is always is but just being curious and noticing and actually sometimes we notice and sometimes we don't and that's okay and if you like and when you're ready if you like just wiggling your fingers maybe shake the arms out a little bit letting the hands gently rest onto the knees so you may want to experiment with sitting tall on your chair feet on the floor about hips width apart Okay. And you may notice your spine lengthening, shoulders widening, and you may just feel your body lengthening up. And if you like, and when you're ready, gently pulling the chin to the chest, arching the spine back, beginning to flex the spine. And if you like, and when you're ready, reversing this, taking the gaze up, bringing the chest through the chin. And again, bringing the chin to the chest, arch in the spine, arch of the spine. So continue with this movement. You may want to bring the breath in. You have choice here. You may want to bring the, the breath in and experiment with that. You might want to inhale, up, oh, exhale, down. Just be curious about that and feel free to maybe add a little more breath. 
and really arch the spine back. You may want to pull on the hands and gently let the body come through, hit the gaze up, even engaging the, the face muscles, that smile, turn the smile on. With the masks, we don't smile as much as so practice the smiling. We'll do this one more time, one more time. Just being curious and noticing any tension or any edge in the spine, upper back shoulders. And again, just coming back to neutral. And I'm gonna ask you to wiggle your feet on the floor, feel your feet on the floor. Maybe push the toes in the floor, pull them up. Can you, can you feel the floor under, under your body? Can you feel your contact with the earth? And if you like, feel free to experiment with turning to one side. Turn to one side. Just stay as comfortable as you can and notice that your spine is lengthening. Keep your spine comfortably tall and feel free to place your hands anywhere that's comfortable for you. So we're coming into a gentle, gentle twist. And you may want to turn to the other side. Turn to the other side and it's your choice where you want to take the gaze either forward, down, up, a little bit further back. And it's your choice if you want to try that on the other side again. So you're in charge of how much you turn. You may turn to just to choose to turn a little bit and twist, or you can take it a little bit deeper. It's up to you. You may want to even take your arm behind and use it as an anchor. And you may want to try that one last time on the other side. Again, can we do this and smile? Can we feel the carpet or the floor underneath? And slowly coming back to neutral. And again, you may notice your body lengthening upwards. And if you like, you could gently tilt your head to one side, eyes open or closed, you choose, you decide. So when you tilt to one side, the muscles of the neck will begin to lengthen. And maybe after a few breaths, you may want to experiment with this on the other side. Oh, again, just being curious and noticing, does one side feel a little stiffer than the other? And you may hear some clicks and pops. Mine's like Rice Krispies, my neck. And then if you like, and when you're ready, gently dropping your chin to the chest, chin to the chest, and gently bringing the chin up to one side. You choose which side. And again, let, noticing a lengthening at the side of the neck. So you can continue with this, going down and then up to the other shoulder. And you may want to experiment with moving and breathing. So can you move, breathe? It's your choice. You can change it, you're not stuck. So continue with that. And then gently coming back to neutral. And if you like, I'm gonna ask you to come back and bring your hands together. Bring your hands together. And I'd like to ask you to give them a rub so you can maybe generate some heat in your hands. And rub the back of your hands, sides of your hands. Okay, great. And I'm gonna ask you to interlink your fingers and just have a little bit of a stretch. Cause when it's cold, we get a little bit stiff. So maybe sort of stretch up and then bringing the palms back together. So can we notice our hands touching? Can we notice our feet on the ground? And sometimes we notice and sometimes we don't. Okay. And if you like, you can begin gently expanding your arms to the side. And it's your choice if you'd like to bring some breath and movement together. And slowly bringing the palms back together. So they're landing together. Can you notice that point where they land together? And we do this two more times. Sipping a little bit more breath in and I'd encourage you to maybe notice, does it feel good if I squeeze my shoulder blades together? I might take the chin up, we gently back bend. Slowly bring it back. So you can experiment with matching my pace 
or you can go at your own pace, whatever feels right for you. And again, I know my hands have dropped off screen, but I like to do some maybe little circles, wiggle my fingers. Just do what feels right for you. Experiment with that. You have choice. Slowly bringing that back together. And if you like, and when you're ready, you might need to sit back a little bit here. I'll move my chair back. The, the joys of Zoom, no legs, okay? So I'm gonna just put my feet on the floor, about hip, hips width apart, hands on the knees, hands on the knees. And I'm gonna invite you to lengthen, lengthen the spine. So you may notice the spine lengthening. And we're gonna slowly lean forward. So if you like, we have the option of just putting the forearms onto the knees and then letting the head just hang. Just the head be soft there, let the head be soft. Just be curious and experiment with that. If you like, and if it feels appropriate, you choose, you can take the feet a little wider and let the hands come down to the floor. Let the hands come down to the floor. You may want to experiment with putting the backs of the hands on the floor. Just take some easy breaths here. You can change, you're not stuck. You might want to gently sway from side to side. And if you like, gently pushing through the feet, push through the feet to gently come back up. Gently come back up, excellent. And slowly letting that go, coming back into the space. Maybe have a wiggle, wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes. And I'll just get set back up again. Okay, great. So taking some easy breaths, noticing your breath again. And I would invite you again to do what you need to do to feel as comfortable as you can. Notice the temperature of your body, temperature of your feet. Okay, what do you need to do to feel more comfortable right now? Okay. So that was a little bit of trauma sensitive yoga. It is very different to regular yoga, and we'll explore this more as we go on. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So for me, I was a yoga teacher. I was a yoga student. Hang on. I'm human. Yoga keeps me well, made me very well. Um, and then I trained as a yoga teacher. My journey to be a therapist is the same path as being doing yoga and being a yoga teacher. So if it wasn't for yoga, I wouldn't be here and I, I wouldn't be waxing lyrical about how great it was. It's, it's a, it's a non-verbal experience that's very positive for me. So the trauma sensitive yoga is a very gentle, mindful yoga. So it's not, you know, what people you see it on Instagram and everyone doing this and a lot of body shaming and all of this other stuff that can go on. It's very gentle and it's very mindful. And for me, the ingredients of it, the methodology, it is the safest tool for working with trauma. The safest tool for working with trauma. I would also say the methodology, the recipe, and I also use it for working with people with depression and anxiety. I want to first of all, just shine a light on the trauma side of it and who we are working with and about safety. Yeah. So, in my own experience and why I do this um, is because for all yoga is wonderful, I saw a lot of, and still do sometimes see a lot of very unsafe activity in yoga. And we are talking here about very, very vulnerable people. So there's a gentleman called Bezel van der Kolk, and I'm sure you're all aware of Bezel. And if you're not, and this is a new area to you, I really would recommend that you get this book it's called The Body Keeps the Score, Mind, Brain and Body. It's not a book that just therapists read in their office. I bumped into someone, actually in the same park I saw those daffodils, and it's a lady who is a student of mine, who I teach the trauma yoga to. And she asked me about um, neuroscience, and I was like, right? And she says, I'm listening to a podcast about it. And I went, okay. And she says, it's got the yoga in it. And I went, okay. Obviously, I get excited. She was listening to this on podcast, right? So it's get clients will read it, spread it around, read it, pass it on. It's not just something that's super academic and hard to get a hold of. So Bezel in the USA, right, had a yoga teacher. Bezel works with trauma. He's great. And Bezel's yoga teacher 
it was called David Emerson. And David Emerson was working with veterans. And in the USA, how there's an insurance model that I'm sure you're all aware of, but in order to get funding for anything, it has to be a box ticking exercise. You may or may not agree with this, um, but it's like this Bible and your symptoms have to fit in, it's hellish basically, right? To get insurance money, so it pays for it. So what happened is Bezel started doing some research that was funded. A lot of the funding was coming from the um, Iran, Iraq wars and historically around PTSD. Um, we, there is earlier research um, with the money from Vietnam. So Bezel got a load of money. Bezel did some research where he started noticing difference with people, with women, traumatized women, women with depression. And I'm naming women. He did work with women and it was around using yoga to have an impact on heart rate variability okay and <clears throat> I've got his research document here and I'm sending it to you afterwards honestly it's quite easy to read and um, so it's maybe worth a flick through so he was doing this yoga and he worked more with this guy David who I'll, I'll introduce later I'll show a little video of him and he wrote this book overcoming trauma through yoga if you are going to get it, so this is for more the yoga teacher um, or the therapist or the chiropodist or someone who's already working with the body, um, I would recommend you get this book. Everything you need to know, there's an introduction here, is in this book. And I can also recommend further training for you if you're interested outside of this. So it's called Overcoming Trauma Through Yoga. That sold really, really well. And then he wrote another one for therapists, okay? So these are people who, because actually what you find is that yoga people and body people are really okay with the body, but want to learn more about being clinical. Whereas clinical people, therapists are, and it's in our training as well to be very careful and we're a little bit more scared of working with the body and there's a lack of confidence. So in the, again, there's that middle ground and what we all have in common. So the highlight here is trauma. And the people that we're working with are people who really we need to be extremely mindful of. These are not people wrapping up to a yoga workshop on a Saturday, right? Who want to do these rebirth and exercise and all of this breathing. We are working with people who are really damaged and also I want to just for phrasing here we are also working with trauma survivors right these are survivors there's a positive light here and with trauma it is always complex there is a real lack of understanding when it comes to trauma especially when people are trying to get people to fit in boxes right especially kids childhood trauma wow so the, the treatment is very varied so with trauma, trauma isn't just I was in NAM or I was in an accident. Trauma exists on a spectrum and it is all relevant and to be validated. So a child who has been unheard or unseen, that is trauma. Okay, birth, just being born is traumatic. So and this trauma has an impact on our adult life so trauma itself plays a debilitating course in the body there is a reduced ability to be in the here and now in that yoga that we just did I talk all the time this is part of the training you talk all the time we need to keep people in the here and now to where possible avoid disassociation to be disassociated is really it's the safest place to be as a trauma survivor. The, the body's alarm system has been turned on, right? So really everything, full power turned on and very often it's never turned off again. People stop taking care of themselves. They never feel relaxed or at ease in life. And also <clears throat> in my work, and I'm sure that you've seen this yourself and by all means share in the chat so we are connected, where I see trauma manifesting in people is chronic pain, muscle spasms, fibromyalgia, a lot of 
diseases and illnesses under the belly button area. ME, fatigue, um, poor immune system. And what happens is that their primal brain is constantly scanning for threat. It is about safety, okay? Very often, um, there is no calm, in fact, there is always no calm center. This is an adult and adults and children. Think of your clients, okay? Think of people you're working with. Think of groups you may have worked with. Sleep is an issue. People don't sleep. The body is alien. It's completely alien to them. And actually, very often, the body is the enemy. This is why they are professionals at being disconnected, numbing. And especially now with COVID, trauma is a real trigger for, COVID has been a trigger for past trauma. And with the lack of regulation that we have at the minute, with not seeing people, being isolated, not being able to communicate, I'm very concerned, as I'm sure you all are, as I'm sure you all are. The immune system becomes completely out of whack where there's been trauma. And we, there's some research that I'll forward to you later that um, the immune systems of incest victims was excessively activated. So they are constantly, the, the assertiveness and the alertness to danger in these women had a huge impact on the immune system and over a long-term study, there was a great percentage that had um, autoimmune diseases and what were deemed medically as chronic illnesses. So again, COVID plays a big part in this um, for where we are now. And it's important that we do hold this in mind because people could have been okay, right? We'll be, people, we are Trauma survivors spend their whole life being in safety and tools to keep to keep well and safe. But then what happens is like a pile of wonky pennies, right? We've been okay, we're okay. Something happens and the pennies fall. Think of COVID, think of the pandemic, think of this ongoing restriction, lack of choice. With trauma, choice has been removed. Yeah, so think about for people, even for ourselves, where has choice been removed? Okay, it's very triggering. So many trauma survivors have a very dull internal world and they're professional at keeping it dull because it's safe, right? It's safe. So this may be drugs, alcohol, food, overwork, um, self-harm. And remember, self-harm is stopping us doing something else, okay? Self-harm, gambling, maybe risky behavior, I don't know, motorbikes, prostitution. Um, and there's a real impact on the autoimmune system of trauma survivors. So I just want to bring in Bezel here, who's going to explain a little bit more, again, in its purest form of who trauma-sensitive yoga is for. Oh, let me just... ADD, emotional problems, trouble making friends. Are people who have experienced childhood trauma more likely to exhibit these behaviors? When trauma occurs at an early age, it affects development in many ways. This can cause reactions in children that aren't even seen in adults with PTSD. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk explains how childhood trauma contributes to these problems. We are really beginning to develop a discipline of childhood trauma. And what we see when we look at those kids is that, um, and these kids as they grow older, that their problems are very different from PTSD. Their problems are primarily has to do with attention, being able to focus in on something and to engage with something in a very steady, consistent way. So they get thrown off, they have a hard time really focusing on things, sticking with things, um, concentrating on things, filtering irrelevant stuff out so they get hijacked. Um, so that's one very big issue which deserves its own whole special um, series of treatments. The second thing is the core issue of affect regulation. And that is that we have our emotions in order to tell us 
what to do and where to go to orient our bodies, our minds to the reality around us. Um, traumatized people's emotions become too large, too extreme, or they become too quiet. And once they get activated, unlike people who are relatively doing pretty well, and you get upset, and 10 minutes later, you're fine again. You go back to work. And so chronically traumatized people keep getting stuck. Uh, something happened yesterday, and today there's still other sorts about it, and tomorrow there's still other sorts about it, and their whole weekend is hijacked by something that's happened. And then they deal with that hijacking by trying to calm themselves down in any way they can. And that's where the whole issue of drugs and alcohol comes in, and self-mutilation and eating disorders, because they all seem to be chronic adaptations to this affect dysregulation problem that you see in this population. Uh, the third area is in the area of relationships. So if somebody has messed with you, you have a basic perception of the world that people will hurt you, will make you not feel safe, that you're helpless, um, that people are going to mess with you. So you position yourself in the world as somebody who should always protect herself or as somebody who should be aggressive or arrogant or distant or dependent and compliant and please everybody because if you stand up for yourself, terrible things will happen for you to yourself. And so there's an amazing sort of three different areas. So it's not about memory, but it's the formation of the self, the brain, the mind, and bodily. It's important for us to understand the roots of the Okay. So it's really important that we hear that from Bezel and also that we really do hold, because it answers the why. Why? Are we speaking all the time? And I'll pull this apart a bit more. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? It's around safety and that we are working with trauma survivors. Like I say, they are not the instinct, oh, I've, I just adjusted them because I felt it was okay. No, we are working with people and we have a res responsibility to keep these people safe, okay? And we what positively what yoga does do is and i'll explain more of this is yoga impacts our nervous system okay when we practice yoga and various other techniques but when individuals with poorly modulated nervous systems trauma survivors nervous systems thrown off balance right there is a lack of coherence between breathing and heart rate and it makes people vulnerable to autoimmune disease mental problems depression, PTSD. And for today, within the introduction, I want us to look at the um, autonomic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. So, and you'll notice this in energy. So for yoga people and people who are fit, who work with energy, you'll know, we talk about the higher energy, prana, hatha, ha and ta, sun and moon. Okay, so I'm, I'm layering some of the Eastern words over um, clinical medical words um, and western words so we have the it's split into two parts and this is how I remember it we have the sympathetic nervous system so this is where the bulls in pampaloma I'm being chased by the lion it's bloody covid it's the pandemic it's that collect it's anxiety it is fear okay and what happens is when the sympathetic nervous system is activated what happens in our body is the red alarm system starts going up. This is for everyone, okay? Adrenaline, cortisol is flooded in the body, th throughout the body. So when the, we have a perceived threat, Stephen Porges, who, um, talk, who talks a lot about the polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve, um, he says that we have three survival systems. Now I'll use the word survival. So it's perceived threat. Okay, so first of all, something happens, I'm going to shout for help. I'm for help, 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 help. When that fails, I can fight. Remember, I'm riddled with adrenaline and cortisol here. I'm going to fight at, for survival or I'm going to run like hell. And the third response is the freeze response. So again, this may be useful. Um, and just notice who, which clients are coming to mind. So think of Think of the stiffness here, okay? So on a very mild scale, this can show up as avoidance, but also, and we'll hear it in our clients' work, 
when they speak. And it's not just clients, people mention, I felt numb, I felt deadness. I had a client the other day, I was paralyzed. I was paralyzed, okay? Positively, these are survival responses. Um, and I just wanna show you this visual. I've got to do a stop share here and hopefully this works. Hang on, I'm obsessed with showing you this video. The audio is rubbish, but I just want you to look um, at the shape of this deer. So it's the deer in the headlights. So just, Zena, can you see it? Is it working? Well, this next story is all about a deer in the headlights, literally. Yeah. <laughs> it happened in Michigan when a deer ran out in front of a car, got caught in the headlights and was scared stiff, really. He didn't move. Bro was in the road for nearly half an hour holding up traffic, and then a sheriff's deputy was called, tried to coax the animal out of the road. <laughs> when that did not work, he finally just picked the deer up <laughs> and moved that. it to the side of the road. Eventually, it took off into the woods, and we should note what the officer did, however, is not recommended. But it's, it's so interesting. It's like that classic deer caught in the headlights. <laughs> it is. Okay, so did you see the shape, the stiffness in the body? And... <sighs> Let me jump back in. So that that frozen response, um, yeah, it's really important that we hold that in mind as well, because that was a survival response. Often say with clients where there's been sexual abuse um, or extreme violence, that they are feeling helpless and numb. However, if very often, if that freeze response hadn't kicked in, they maybe wouldn't, or they probably wouldn't have survived. So it's a survival response. And when the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, the muscles tense, the brain stops thinking, okay? There is an emotional response. The breath increases, respiration increases, energy is drawn away from digestion. So that's where you get the dry mouth. Yeah, you get a dry mouth because it's drawn away from there and the immune system. So, and we can often feel sick, yeah, because the adrenaline's gone in there and the cortisol and the, the blood pumps to the major muscles so we can fight, flight or hold that frozen, yeah. And the other side, or, and with our trauma clients, they spend most of and have maybe spent all of their life up here, up here. So there's the deer. And the other end, the more hypoarousal hyper is the parasympathetic nervous system. Healthily, we have rest, digest, feed and breed. And with yoga, I'm really happy um, that now yin yoga, restorative yoga exists and pe people are accessing this. However, on a more extreme scale, we have emotional numbing. This is depression. There's no movement, okay? Excessive sleep social avoidance, disassociation, um, intrusive memories. Yeah, and within this, the immune system, again, positively, if we've been up and we start to come maybe to a, a window of tolerance in the middle, the immune system starts to function again. But when we go down, so again, it's more cut off, more depression. Yeah, in the hyper aroused state, again, the immune system stops working and we're going towards shutdown actually we're going towards shutdown so um this is something that's really useful then i work with yoga teachers so that they're able to explain this clinically and that we start to talk about the window of tolerance so the hypo hyper arousal the anxiety the sympathetic fight flight freeze is we're up, okay? So this is the increased sensations, flashbacks, disorganized cognitive processing, high. So we're, this is where very often our trauma survivors, like I say, have spent their whole life. Anything with, with yoga, for a flash, for a moment, it may bring them down. And even with regular yoga, it takes us into our window of tolerance. So the window of tolerance is where emotions can be tolerated and information integrated. Social engagement. This is why I'm so worried of, uh, with a lack of social engagement for people because we're unable to regulate without, without other people. And this is non-verbal with eye contact and pace. And then, so the lower end, the more depression, 
Yeah, the immobilization, the immobilized response is where there is a numbing of emotions, reduced physical movement, it's a hypo arouse zone. So again, I'd, I'd really like you to hold in mind that with our trauma survivors that this yoga is for, we are working through the window of tolerance when the heart rate becomes more stable, when we're able to, and, and actually if people didn't feel this, so I'm putting a clinical sort of mask on what we all know is if people didn't feel this, they wouldn't come back to yoga. Why have people been doing yoga for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years? I just happen to go back. It's because we feel it. And for our trauma survivors, again, they're not, they may never come into a window of tolerance, but there will be a, something that with a connection with self, a real connection with self. Okay. And I'm going to send you a lot more information around the autonomic nervous system, the high, the low. But again, in this is maybe useful for the clinical audience here that with yoga, the language in yoga is ha ta, higher energy, lower energy, sun, sun, moon. The lower energies maybe is more female and yielding. And in the work of a, a yoga teacher, how the yoga teacher will design their classes around energy. So for example, if everybody's anxious, it may be useful to bring in some lower, lower, because if you're already anxious to bring in a higher energy class, we're gonna go up. So what, and where's the middle? And where's the middle? Okay, and we're gonna look at that a little bit more after the break, and we're gonna connect this more with yoga and yeah, so I'm going to ask you now, to tip. we've got 10 minutes now, so we're going to go into a movement break now. I'd really like you to ask you to go and move, breathe, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Go and get what you need. So we're going to segue now into a little bit more about yoga and what's great about the, the trauma-sensitive yoga. And I, also, I'm the, trauma-sensitive is a sort of copyright put onto this so people can make a bit of money um, in the States selling book, but actually... This that was one of the early, if not the starting place where you've got trauma informed yoga, embodied yoga. OK, so again, I'd like you to hold this in mind and specifically for me around safety with clients. The trauma informed is the best I've seen for safety and boundaries for both the therapist or the teacher and the client or student so what for me what's great is these this can be applied in a yoga class or also in one-to-one -one, in therapy and on zoom okay so i'm going to ask you right now before we start this just to find your steady place feet on the ground maybe wiggle your toes <sighs> take that breath okay just so you, what do you need to do to feel steady now and how can you feel more comfortable maybe might want to look at the sun, open the window, whatever feels right for you. Okay, so yoga, right, it's great. I love yoga and I really need to highlight that, that I love yoga and it is my medicine, even now, every day, um, as well as many other things that I need to do to stay well. This is the big part of who I am. Um, and research and writing on the mind-body connection that is what I talk about, and often there is resistance to this, but it does have its roots in Asian traditions, predominantly in India and China. And in these traditions, mind and body are always connected. You will know about this. You wouldn't be here now if you didn't know about this, okay? And this has been extensively documented over many thousands of years, yes? 5,000 years, I even went to Egypt and went to this bizarre crypt and found there were there was like yoga sequences on the old there were I, I believe they were doing yoga the Egyptians were doing yoga because I saw I actually saw it with my own eyes like these yoga sequences um and yeah so this it's been whereas what we're talking about yeah with science it's like a couple of hundred years right but it's a grain of sand on the beach um, however, it's how we speak about things medically. So, and where you will see this a lot is the traditions of, yes, yoga, 
meditation and for me meditation is part of yoga and ayurveda ayurvedic studies if you are interested in mind body and the east please go and dive into some ayurvedic stuff and um, so um one of the most important texts in yoga is called the yoga sutras a sutra is a thread so there's many hundreds of these tiny threads okay and it was written by somebody called patanjali 500 years bc so he inherited his knowledge about yoga from the vedas which are even more ancient scriptures probably from the egyptians um, and these are the most ancient records um, in Indian culture, the Vedas. So in this text, and what one of the questions is, and it's one of the early questions, what is yoga? And that's what we're going to discuss now, what is yoga? So in Sanskrit, I can't say it in Sanskrit, um, but what the answer is, is cessation of the fluctuations of the mind, right? This is 500 years BC to practice what this interest that we all have, a cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. So let me just show you this quick video now that puts a little bit more science on that. Whoops. This is an ancient Indian dude with far too much time on his hands. And these guys are cutting edge pioneering brain scientists. Now what could they possibly have in common? Welcome to the science of yoga and what it means to us. Part one. Let's go back thousands of years to the ancient world. The first mystics would leave their towns, villages and everyday distractions to find solace in the forest. Sorry, clicking about. This is an ancient Indian demon. Welcome to the science of yoga and what it means to us. Part one. Let's go back thousands of years to the ancient world. The first mystics would leave their towns, villages and everyday distractions to find solace in the forest. There, in isolation, they studied their own inner experience. As they looked within, what they found was a myriad of thoughts and emotions, just like most people would. And also, like most people, these thoughts seemed to cause anxiety and seemed to serve no real practical purpose. But with vigilant observation, the mystics found that when they stopped feeding their thoughts, they started to get quieter and quieter. They were quite literally changing their state of mind from the inside out. The mystics in India called this practice vipassana, which means clear seeing. Today, we call it meditation. Now, fast forward to the early 2000s. Scientists studying the brain and the effect of brain exercises started to make some surprising discoveries. Brain science was still in its infancy. And in fact, up until late into the 20th century, it was still thought that the brain was solid, like concrete, unable to change in its structure. But then they discovered a phenomenon called brain plasticity. It seemed the brain could actually change. It could be shaped and rewired by exercise. And guess what they found had the power to cause structural changes? Yep, meditation. Several studies found a whole host of structural changes in the brains of people who meditated. Here are some of the changes they found. The default mode network, which could stimulate wandering and aimless thought grooves, was quietened down. The amygdala, which processes fear and anxiety, reduced in size and activity. Grey matter in the sensory regions of the brain increased, which in turn enhanced sense perception. These were startling discoveries, and it became clear that there was something to this ancient practice after all. But it's not just neuroscience. The field of psychology also owes some recent developments to this Eastern philosophy. The mystics of old times claimed this simple fact. With regular insight, you'll see that your thoughts are not real and the recent success of cognitive talk therapy uses this exact same strategy. The subject learns to see the falseness of their own repetitive thinking. They're simply an interpretation of what is going on, not the actuality of what's going on. So what's the difference, you might ask? Well, say someone next to you makes a sarcastic remark. 
This may trigger you to start thinking about a number of possible explanations, and they could all be completely false. For example, she did that on purpose. Everyone does this to me. They're all planning to keep me down, etc. See how these thoughts lead to other thoughts which multiply with each other? The philosophy of Vipassana is to see that these thoughts are nothing more than stories in your head. And as you get better, they stop multiplying so quickly. But don't be disheartened, it takes practice. By the way, you don't necessarily have to look like a yogi or sit like a pretzel to meditate. So whether it's breathing meditation, watching meditation, dancing or fishing meditation, whatever clears your mind is a great place to start. All of these techniques contribute to a healthier mind. There is something that brain science is starting to substantiate, and it's what ancient mystics said all those years ago. Brilliant. So, we love yoga. It's great. And I just want to throw a light again on safety. So, think back to this group of people, trauma survivors, people with depression, people with anxiety, what might not be safe in a yoga class? You know, when we ask, what is yoga now? What is yoga now? Um, yeah, there's many different types of yoga. Um, I'll put some visuals here. And we're just going to jump into a quick breakout group for 10 minutes. Zena's going to, by the power of Zena's wonderful magic, going to send us off. And just to talk about what may not feel safe, what, what may feel unsafe in a regular class, yoga class for this group of people okay and then we'll come back and feed that back we're back yeah we're all back we're all back so welcome back everybody thank you for doing that and i would like to i think there were seven groups there i'd like to ask as a group to that we could feed some of this back what you heard about what may feel unsafe in a regular yoga class and also feel free to use the chat as well um for the introverts in the house which is absolutely fine as well. Um, what did you hear and what would be useful to share in the group? So what, what, do you, what would be unsafe in a regular yoga class for this group of people? Just unmute yourself. We spoke about um, things like um, touch, like, um, you know, I had an ex example where I'd been to a, a yoga class and the instructor came around and touched my head when I didn't even, I didn't realize she was going to do that. Um, and somebody said e even being invited to, to lie down on the floor with your eyes closed could be really difficult for people. Um, and uh, somebody said something really important about that word invitation. So sometimes that word's used, oh, this is just, this is an invitation, mm -hmm. but sometimes it it really feels like an invitation, like you have a choice, but often it, it's just a word and actually you, you don't really feel like you've got a choice. You, you have to do that move or um, pull that pose or, and sometimes it's not that comfortable. Yeah. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you for being brave and speaking as well. <laughs> First one. Okay, what else did we hear in the groups? Hi, um, we talked about just simply being in a group setting. Mm -hmm. um, so just if you've never um, practiced yoga before, even just going into a big group full of people, um, is it can be quite intimidating. And I know, I think I, I probably even felt that in my first class, you know, um, sort of wanting to hide in the back of the class <laughs> thinking the yoga teacher's not going to come around your way so there was a sort of bit of that just feeling like you don't know these people you don't know the movements and yeah mm. thank you Piera no, no problem um, I've just got one for the, from the chat just uh, so this is from uh, John Arthur's group um, so unsafe um, using straps, touch, lights, um, uh, lights getting put off, switched off, I'm, I'm assuming, and then uh, not explaining why we're doing the moves, instructing rather than inviting, um, mm. sharing with others, I think that was, and um, like the stress of potentially feeling stupid, maybe if you don't, if I, I hope I interpreted that correctly, if you, if you don't, you know, I guess maybe if you can't do something or 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, John's group. Um, uh, with something we brought up in our group was um, not just about being touched, but also not knowing where the teacher is in the room. Ooh. So the teacher being kind of how close they might actually be almost in your in your safe field. You know, it could be a really big one. Yes, that's a good one. It's like the lat the tiger came to me there. It's like the predator, right? Yeah. We talked about um, maybe feeling unsafe in the, the, the quiet, having intrusive thoughts. Yeah. Um, some body positions being feeling unsafe, you know, for victims of, of abuse in the past. Um, and then sometimes the stillness as well. If you're someone that, that's you know, hypervigilant, needs to move all the time, taking away that safety strategy of movement um, might feel unsafe. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Amelia. Also, the, the setup of the room might uh, be unnerving for some people if they um, if they have to we'll have to consider where the door is if they know how to how to get out how to exit yeah absolutely you know in the hot yoga I don't know if you see it's like a big womb right and they zip you in and I've been in there when people have had panic attacks um because they can't get out it's awful but yeah ah, great point Leighton great about the room and the door excellent We'd said something about um, a sense of agency and, and the kind of the demand of that in, in that setting. You know, I think most of us will have had that kind of sense of, you know, giving yourself permission to do, not to do, you know, and that level of um, kind of demand on one's brain. But mm -hmm. also the flip side of that is if something is kind of triggering or whatever, in fact, that, that the person may not have that connection between mind and body. So, so that sense of how to move the body in space and, and actually respond to the requests could be, you know, really unsettling or, or just yeah. unknown, really. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, that's a great point, Alison. And I love you're on the floor in the kitchen. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Often with trauma survivors, there's no left and right. So mm -hmm. within, the, within the language of trauma-sensitive yoga, there's no left and right um, that's difficult to teach. But yeah, you're absolutely, yeah, spot on. Great point. Anything else around safety? And you may have experienced it yourself. Mm, great points. Great points. I'm going to just jump into the share here, Zena. Okay, Zena's keeping me right today. So, um, yeah, things that are unsafe in the class, and we've covered lots of them here um, in, in the group, and thank you for that. I'm going to just put a little highlight on a few other ones. It's a, often the class is large, and remember, we're online now. So, I don't, yoga teachers, if I just do a quick stop share here, yoga, people teaching yoga, if you're on the gallery view, and you may be a therapist and a yogi or bodywork, can you give us a bit of a wave so you'll know, I'll know you're teaching online. So, we've got some yogis, people teaching. Great, great, great. And a bit of this, if you're of this, you're of that, right? We're all in, we're all together. So people working with the body, John's doing a paddle there, great stuff. So I'm gonna go on the share screen. And this isn't making, there's no, it's holding in mind the group of people we're working with, okay? So we've gotta keep people safe. So often, often the classes are large, people are close together. Obviously on Zoom, not a problem, but for me, I'd be really triggered with all the maths. I'm obsessed with eat myself with space. And I always want to be like everybody wants to be in the far back corner. If there could be 30 corners of the room, we'd all be there, right? Again, touch, the lady who said, spoke first about um, touch. I'm actually glad that there'll be no touch moving forward, to be very honest with you. And I know there's lovely, things associated with adjustment and this, we're working with vulnerable people. And also think just how you might integrate this yourself. And just so you know, for the yogi people, therapist, we don't do touch unless, unless there are clinical reasons for it. So it's like the opposite of yoga when it comes to touch. So it's like that touching without being asked. Um, I actually tried this myself for the last, I've been doing this work and training about it for about five years so I've started in classes when I was going to classes you because teacher yoga teachers say well I, I always ask um for anyone to put their hand up and I say well how many people put their hand up 
No one. Can you imagine that you are vulnerable? Like you're going to put your room up, hand up in a room of 20 people. Actually, one lady did, um, a Muslim lady, a friend of mine, and she did. Um, she did, but she's the only person who's told me that. So I thought, right, I'm going to try it. So I was in a yoga class at the front and the yoga, I did it. I, I said, you know, they have everyone down and they said, put your, raise your hand if you do want to be touched. So I did it and I test it now when I go to classes. This teacher, she wouldn't leave me alone. She wanted to fix me. She took it personal. And it was, oh, it was cringeworthy. Um, and some places, again, they put little cards. Try Yoga in London have these, oh, had these little cards that you put down about not wanting to be touched. It's a bit of shame, I think, around that. I think it's quite shameful. Um, clothing, right? So um, often it can feel unsafe in a regular yoga class or on Instagram, Think of the body shaming that's going on, right? So in a regular class, um, maybe the teachers are expected to wear skinny things. So maybe the students are expected to wear clothing that may be revealing. Partner work. This has been a real trigger for me. And it took me 20 years to about a year and a half ago to be able to say, no, I'm not doing that. And actually when I turned around and I did know the teacher, for me, when I said that, two other women and one man said they didn't want to do it either. It's that. And yes, and I've been in a room where teachers say it's great for community. It's great for this. And I've been in that space where it's wonderful. Think of the vulnerable people that we are working with here. Vulnerable people. Partner work. Mixed gender. I would get in that room. I keep myself safe. I've scanned that room, paired everyone up. And I'm like, I'll end up with that man. And then I've actually had to go into that. It's horrendous. Absolutely. For me, it's been horrendous. So it's like the lady said, you can't really say no. There's a real emphasis on the external. So think about when people have been groomed, right? And actually as a yoga teacher, you're, you do often say, oh, that's Leighton, great shape. Or Zena, wonderful tree. Or, you know, just think about the um that emphasis on external and shape that can be very triggering and these compliments of singling people out and grooming and i'm sure you all well if you're not aware you will be now that a lot of with the me too movement a lot of the yoga teachers are um have been investigated around sexual assault mr bikram there's a reason now why we say hot yoga and people don't use the word bikram yoga because He's on trial for multiple rapes in the USA. There's a Netflix documentary on him. There's been a huge amount of abuse at, because when you get on that mat, you have power, right? Just me sit, I'm sitting in the seat. I'm host. There is power. There's a big power dynamic. And also John mentioned as well about the tone. It's very commanding. And in your training, you are trained to, you've got to get 30 people doing a shape, right? So there's a bit of pace, a bit bossy, right, within that. Um, and also, <clears throat> there's a little understanding of triggering and disassociative potential of the props, like John mentioned. In the trauma centre, there's no props. So again, think about abuse of people being bound. There's no belts, right? Regular, it's great you see the belt. Think about people who've been bound and held with abuse. There's also... Um, there's no bells, right? There's no bells and whistles and symbols and magic um, because again, there's huge issues around that when we're working with this group of people. And I'll put my hand up, right? When I started learning this stuff, I was like, oh my God. When, you know, cause as a yoga teacher and as someone who practices yoga, I love doing yoga Nidra. I love doing this stuff. It's the closest thing I get to taking drugs. I'll be very honest with you now, doing yoga nidra, right? Um, when I was taking people into visuals, taking them into the meadow, really. And and, I, and again, why I do this, I would be on retreats in like all over the world and people would be freaking out. They'd be in like rebirthing exercises with blankets over them, legs bound like this. I'd say women have to fly home. Suddenly the person had had to go home from the retreat. So with the teachers, it's, it's not necessarily their fault, but I didn't know I was a yoga teacher, not a therapist. It's this potential for um, just for disassociation, for triggering, for psychosis, actually. 
right? Um, and also just being aware of that power, the guru culture, right? That, oh, everybody come back and have a cup of tea at mine, real issues with boundaries with teachers. Again, I didn't used to know this stuff. Honestly, I didn't, I'd have cups of tea at the end and yogi tea and all of this. Yeah, so what is interesting with the trauma sensitive yoga is invitational language. Okay, so you'll notice it's always a welcome. If you like, there is choice giving here. It's invitational language. I'll share the language with you and you'll be getting the slides later. And also I would recommend that for the yoga teachers, that one book, Charlotte, can you put it up to the screen? I don't know if people can see it. Um, the, it's the, the first book by David. So it's about making choices, make yourself comfortable. Sometimes you notice um, people can leave. It's fine. And there's a, also there's a lot of emphasis on present moment awareness. This is where possible to avoid, and we can't avoid it, right? Disassociation. So you talk a lot. I talk a lot. I'm exhausted when I teach these classes, right? There's no silence. There is no shavasana. There might be a pause for three to five breaths at the end, okay? Um, the, yeah, the language, there's no student comments in trauma-sensitive yoga. And I find, you find that hard. There is no touch, right? Even there was no touch. And you can touch people over Zoom, actually, right? Teaching online, you can still touch them and have contact with them, just, just being mindful of that. Um, yeah, no touch, no props. And it's hard. And I know a teacher said to me, actually, he stopped touching students. And he said to me, well, is it who's touching who? Do the students want to be touched? Or does the teacher want to touch the student? Think of the power of touch. As therapists, we know this. As yoga teachers, I didn't. Who wants to teach who? Who wants to connect with who? Who wants that person to sign up to 10 more yoga classes or be on a monthly? Yeah, there's issues with boundaries there. Okay, so no props, no blocks, no symbols. In the pure form of trauma-sensitive yoga, they don't even use pose. Think of sexual posing, grooming. They use the word form, a form, okay? Um, timing's very important, and it's usually a shorter class to start with with groups. No touch, no verbal. And honestly, I do struggle with this when I'm doing it because you can sort of see people doing well and you train to give them strokes so you are changing seat here the mats very interesting with the mats I stopped putting mats down in a regular class you put the mats down to get them in give people the choice let them put their mats where they feel I say put your mat where you feel more safe and one lady would come in she had severe anxiety and she came with a social worker um, nobody's allowed to join in by the way no one can watch Nobody's sitting in a seat in the corner. If the I've had policemen come and bring people, or the policemen can either join in or they wait outside. Nobody's watching. Think about abuse here where people are watching people, right? Um, but yeah, let people put their mats where they want in a safe place. Um, where possible with these classes, there's no drop-ins, no drop-ins, no watching. Teacher, for me, I wear really baggy clothes, no makeup. I wouldn't have any lipstick on. I've got eyeliner on. I wouldn't have any of that. And actually when people see it, they'll sit, sometimes people don't recognize me, <laughs> um, which I think is great. If they see me and I'm in my therapist get up in Newcastle or wherever I am, oh, I didn't recognize you, Lorna. Basically, because I've got a bit of makeup on and you know, my hair's not up in a clip and, and I'm not wearing baggy clothes, but it's, to, and that, it's really, it's taking that sexual side of it out there. Um, yeah, no makeup, no nail varnish. Yeah, there's a lot, and I'm sharing all of these with you for later on. It, again, this is about choice and empowerment for people. Very, very important. Um, Lorna, can I just put a question to you? Please? Yeah. So um, Helen's saying a friend of hers is a trauma sensitive uh, yoga practitioner and she does one-to-one -one sessions with her eyes closed. Um, wow. I have a client who wouldn't feel comfortable with me seeing her movement. Is that something you would do? Well, it would be, I would never do it one-to-one. -one. 
for the trauma work, I would never do it one to one. It's too intense. And remember, these people are used to pleasing and being adaptive. So even when I when I do it at the recovery college or even online or in other groups I've worked in with mind, I don't do it if it's one person. Two people is a bit intense. It's too much. I also have people, I don't make eye contact with people when I do it. I look down, which is weird, right? When you're teaching, you make no, it's too much for people. It, it, it may have taken someone 20 years just to get there that day, right? So, yeah, so eye contact. I have done it one-to-one -one with some people in the pay, but that's all discussed in advance and they want one-to-one but again, the eye contact. So here's something very important as well that I bring into the space. Whether we're using these tools, okay, so that's the grounding tools, these gentle movement tools as a therapist. As a therapist, two people, even on Zoom, I'm not looking at you. When I do this with people online and I'm working on Zoom, I name that I'm turning my seat away. Yeah, I've turned my seat. I'm looking out of the window and I ask them to do the same. Okay, they can choose to look back, eyes open, so they are not being looked at. That was a good comment, Ruth, actually. So in therapy, we turn away from the person and we do it with them. They're not being watched. So, I'll, and I will share, which is a boundary in therapy, I will share if my neck's bad or my back's bad. In therapy, we're normally like the vanilla canvas, right? I, I bring it into the space, I'm human in the space but you do it with them. Okay, so great point there. Is that, is that anything else, Sina, before I move on? No, that's all right. Um, yeah, that, that was just the one question. So Helen, if you're happy with that, um, we'll... Oh, it was Helen, yeah. Good, great, great catch there. Okay, think of these other questions, stick them in the chat, Sina will get them, we'll get to them, and I'm gonna send you lots of resources here. Remember, this is an introduction. Um, so I want to talk about the therapeutic goals of, so this is trauma sensitive. This also applies to trauma informed or embodied yoga. It's important that this is, that you have knowledge of this because you were, we're working with people who are well, and we may need clinical intervention. So you can't be talking about, I don't know, dream catchers, crystals and gongs, right? If you're working with doctors and consultants, we have to have credibility here. We know the tools work, but there is a, a layer of credibility in science that we need. So practice. So here are the four therapeutic goals of trauma informed work. OK, number one. OK, we've got about 10 minutes here. We've got practice making choices, choice making with trauma. Choice has been taken away. So this is about mats, lights. Can people, people can leave at any time and that's okay. I had one lady who would come for about 12 minutes and, she, and she'd leave. She knew she could come back in a regular class. I think people would feel ashamed, they wouldn't leave. Um, the language is important and I'm sharing the language with you in the slides later on that you'll receive. Notice, experiment, you decide, feel free. Okay. And it's very important here that it's very clear it, as a yoga teacher, not for therapist, people do not need to share their stories. And in fact, if you're going to, if you're interested in this, you don't get into it. You refer onwards. You have a little number of some local therapists. Yeah. Or the, maybe the recovery center where you are, the Samaritans number. You are not people's therapists. You're their yoga teacher. You may be interested in that work. You have to look after yourself because actually what would you do if somebody said to you that they're suicidal at six o'clock on a Friday night and they've got your number and you're at home with your kids. So this is where it's really important to hold that line and hold that boundary. And yeah, the boundary is very, very important. So people can make choice. And again, with trauma, this is a wonderful quote that someone said to me is, you cannot remind me enough that I have choice. I have choice. Yeah, really important. So for me, that something beautiful happened, which I, is just flipping brilliant. So again, in a regular class, all the mats are out and I would always try and get in the far corner a minute before it started. When I started teaching the trauma yoga and you're giving people choice, 
people who usually go to yoga classes would just go to the same like spot every week yeah like the sort of terrible joke about germans and towels and on beaches in this class when i said to people place your mat where you want to be and then you give them choice and you know you can move your mat 10 people in a room everyone stood up and moved their mat the lights were off the window blinds were going like this that would never happen so in your work how can you start to incorporate choice and doing it online how can you be creative and give people choice okay the next therapeutic goal which is very important in all trauma informed work is present moment awareness within the trauma sensitive yoga they call it interception which i did highlight to them you can't copyright because that's a yoga word from you know 500 years before jesus was born um so the single most important issue for traumatized people is to find a sense of safety in their own bodies and it's their choice if they don't want to do that and use other ways so the goal of any treatment is to help people live in the present okay um or behaving a court rather than being triggered by the past big issues here disassociation no shavasana no visualizations no going into the meadow okay it's dangerous it's dangerous now i want to just talk about breathing here so you know breathing is our anchor just check in with your own breath here okay but with trauma survivors they may not even know their breath and it's not our place to shame them around that. And I've experienced firsthand the shame around trauma survivors. They don't even know they breathe. So you may see this with people with open mouth breathing. They often a shortened chest or intercostal muscles, shallow breathing or a holding of the breath. So the breathing, they've, so we can't go in with all these breathing exercises and all of this. So. Breath is mostly automatic. However, flashbacks can be triggered by interoception. No matter how much I'm talking and speaking about the lengthening and the this, yeah? So sensory messages from muscles and connective tissue. If you are interested in connective tissue and the word fascia, yogi people will know the word fascia, which is a bit like the Spider-Man suit that exists under our skin that keeps us together. The liquid in the fascia and the chemicals in there, they remember. So somebody mentioned this earlier about remembering a specific position, action or intention. This is a source of triggering. So the, ex and what will happen is that often the accelerated heart rate and breathing reminds us of the initial trauma. So I work with a client at the minute and she was doing like PT with like a boxing person and it's great and it's good for serotonin. But what happened was her heart would hit a certain beat and she would go into panic because she was triggered because of the trauma. So it's just being mindful around breath and breath is the doorway to the nervous system. Remember we talked about earlier, the high, the low, and trauma survivors have many layers of physiological defenses to protect them, right? Remember, they've spent their whole life keeping safe. And as somebody told me, who is wonderful in one of my trauma groups, she said, and I was really worried about, you know, the breathing, the triggering, the downward dog, is it sexual? And she said, Lorna, I spend my whole life being safe and if I didn't like you and if I didn't trust you or thought you were dangerous I wouldn't be here you do not need to tell me to put my back to the wall I spend my whole life oh, with my back to the wall yeah so there's a point where it's important that we have this knowledge but do not take any power away from those survivors okay i have just noticed and I'm quite impacted by that okay so again by removing too many of maybe the breathing, the messages too quickly can result in destabilization for people. However, don't discount um, that their professionals are keeping themselves well, which is great and to be celebrated. So deep breathing may be overwhelming with trauma. 
and again with anxiety. So to prevent shame, we keep it, the, the voice, the constant talking. Again, this is what, if we're doing movement and therapy with people as well, gives people something to come back to, come back to. So within the trauma sensitive yoga, there'll be awareness of breath. We may mention awareness of breath, breathing and moving like we did earlier, adding a little more breath, adding, but what we do not do for the trauma, if we're working with groups of traumatized people is ujjayi breath, kapali balti breath, and any breath holding. So ujjayi, for people who don't know, is the strange sort of Darth Vader breath or the pumping breath. It's great for energy. Working with depression and anxiety is different. If you're working with groups of depression and anxiety, we would work with maybe kapali balti. So if someone's depressed, energy up, okay? So I'd also be creative because the sounds involved there as well. Okay. So um, just before we go to the break, I'm going to just bring Bezel back in to leave us a little message. The greatest frustrations in, that I see in the tens of thousands of clinicians who I train around the world in the treat treatment of traumatized people is that their patients keep getting stuck. They get getting stuck in um, in having too many feelings by being overwhelmed by fear and feeling shut down and unable to engage. Um, so the great challenge in treating traumatized people is to help them to be focused and to be present in the here and now. And talking alone generally does not do that. And so what is necessary for us is to begin to explore how people can become still and focused and be present in the here and now. And there a major um, avenue was learning about yoga and learning about traditions that are not Western traditions, not part of Western psychological traditions, but traditions that have been practiced in China and in India and in Africa for thousands of years. And those are practices that have to do with one, interoception, noticing yourself, feeling yourself and learning how to quiet yourself down through movement like Tai Chi, through breath as you find in yoga, and through um, movements that help your body to calm down and to come into the present. So people may start taking a yoga class. And um, initially when they start have any feelings at all, they become so freaked out by those feelings that they need to cut themselves with razor blades to make those feelings go away. And now they take a yoga class. At least the yoga teacher says, notice your leg, notice your butt, notice your abdomen when you make that twist. And the calm voice of the yoga teacher and the quiet encouragement to just focus, to not associate, and the guided voice, the guided power of breathing to just feel what you're feeling and to notice that your feelings are there and keep changing. And when you focus on your toe, you have a different feeling than when you focus on your knee, which is a different focus than when you feel your butt. You become aware of what actually goes on in your, your body. And the next time when somebody doesn't say good morning to you or you are working very hard, you don't get overwhelmed by your feelings. You notice what goes on in your body. And instead of cutting yourself, you may sit, take some time to breathe and to notice what's going on and to restore that inner sense of calm without popping a pill, without taking a drug, or without, without mutilating yourself. But that's a function of learning to trust yourself and to know yourself. But that is, can only be done if you practice and do it regularly with the guidance of somebody who trusts that you can eventually establish that sense of ownership over your own body. Try to imagine how yoga might impact your practice. Okay, 
So we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll go for a break at one and we'll take the 10 minute break at one. OK, I just want to finish off a little bit more of the, the four therapeutic goals. So the third one is taking effective action. So the experience of being um, trauma is being disempowered, being immobilized, that paralyzed. So anything that we can do to give people um, choice and empowerment is very important. OK, so any intervention that empowers survivors will foster recovery. So this might be, is there something you can do right now to make yourself feel more comfortable? And people will move. So that might be, um, do I want to sit or do I actually want to stand? Okay, how do I want to do that? There's a muscle memory that goes on. And I'd like you to just try that now. Can I just ask you all just to stand up and just change your position now? Just change your position, stand up. We can all stand up and go up to the spot in the room where you feel more safe. Go look in the room and just move, move to that place and breathe. Just notice that. And when you're there, I'm gonna ask you to take your arms out to the side and just do a three six. You just turn slowly, feeling steady, checking the space out. Okay. Okay, just notice that. And now coming back to wherever you feel more comfortable. So giving choice. Do I need the lights on? Is it getting cold? Do I want to put a blanket on? It's very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. So no intervention that takes power from the survivor can possibly foster her recovery, no matter how much it appears to be in her immediate interest. So I would often hear yoga teachers, I could, I, I just, I just knew I had to do that. I just, it, it was intuitive, not with these people, not with these people. Okay. So the words again that I'll share with you, and you'll get them in slides later. How can you begin to integrate? Be curious, investigate, if you like, when you're ready allow experience and also very important which for me is really important now with covid is how we can create rhythms and remember in the classes and on zoom it works on zoom how we can begin to regulate with each other um because and this is why very often we'll say we'll do this three times because trauma occurs in relationships with others and there's a lack, a lack of sense of connection and relationship with others and in turn, the self, okay? So just before, yeah, and it's a non-verbal space, people on the, the trauma wards, well, the wards in the hospital sometimes that I walk, work in, that say, well, I come here because I don't have to speak to anyone. I get that. You don't have to speak. Yet you're still in a place where we, where we can regulate together. So I'm going to ask us all to do this now. I'm going to stop share. And before we go for our break, I'd like you to sit on the edge of your seat or on the floor where we are. Let your arms just fall to the side. And we're going to take three powerful breaths together. Three powerful breaths together. Eyes open or closed. In fact, just so you can notice what's maybe some movement of other people. And we're going to inhale. Maybe add a little more breath here. Slowly bring the arms down. Two more times. Inhale. Add a little more breath at the top. Moving together, moving together. And for the final time, look, we're regulating together. Pull it down. Okay, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break um, so we'll come back at 10 past one and then we're going to go into the last section where we're going to look at some theory and we'll also do about a 10, 15 minute practice on the floor as well. You don't need a mat. So go and get what you need. I'd encourage you to maybe get some fuel because we're on lunchtime. Um, so just some fuel that will see you through for till we get to two o'clock. OK, so I look forward to seeing you in 10 minutes. So we got it. We'll be wrapping up and this is the last section. We're going to look at some theory. And also then do a bit of movement, yeah, which will be which will be good to put some movement in today. So I've had a few questions coming through about how is this being used in therapy? 
So very much, yes, we can use it as yoga teachers, but also as a therapist, I use this in with over half of my clients, not all of my clients. And really the movements that we did at the beginning, so it's about feeling steady. How can we begin to notice and feel steady in ourselves and actually asking our clients to feel steady and grounded? And where we're able to maybe work with the breath. So we may not even use the word yoga with people. What does yoga mean? Is that for the rich, skinny white people? Yeah, who are we work? But we all breathe, we all breathe. So I worked with someone who was, a, he was initially very suicidal, a man, um, very, very high anxiety. And we're able to talk about the breath. So with anxiety, a tool, this is a tool for people to use to be able to turn to when they are in crisis or having panic. With anxiety, inhale for four, exhale, longer exhalation, maybe for six. Inhale for four, do this with me, exhale for six. The longer exhalation will bring us back from the sympathetic place, that high place, down very quickly, couple of breaths to feel it. Give clients breath. And when we're working together on Zoom, really, how are we feeling steady? Does the client have their shoes off? What do they need to do to feel steady right now and feel safe? And we may bring some breathing exercises in to feel grounded and bringing the body in. So it's around the wording, notice, being curious and we would often contract for the work to do some movement and breathing. And remember, this isn't a hard sell. This was a hard sell 20 years ago. I don't know how I got people in yoga classes. The number one show on Netflix now is Headspace. Watch it. The clients are watching it. It's brilliant. Little 10 minute, beautiful animations and then a 10 minute meditation. People are doing it. Young people, old people, they've got the apps. Okay, so in the room, again, the principles, and I'm sending, I'll send them to you some takeaways later on around that we turn away, that we do this together, to breathe together, to maybe bring some movement in. So the dropping of the chin to the chest, the gentle twist. So everything we did at the beginning, I'm sending you a video of this workshop. That beginning section is more than you will need to work one-to-one -one with clients. Okay, it's not for everyone. And then the, the client may do that as homework. How can they begin to breathe to have the tool to come down? Or if they're depressed, to energize up with the breath. So I hope that's useful. Please fire any more questions there. The tools can be applied to both. The wording can be applied, the noticing, bringing it into consciousness. Okay, so let's do a jump into some theory. And let me just jump in. I'll keep it a little bit lighter. It's not that light, but I'll keep it lightish. And I'm sending you lots to read about afterwards. So again, this is because we're taking the felt self from 500 years BC and we're putting it and I'm working in clinical places now. Some of you will be working with drugs, alcohol, addiction, um, abuse. So we have to have some underpinnings here for safety when we are working with people who are vulnerable. So the first underpinning here is attachment theory. So attachment theory, you could probably take 10 years learning about this. And it's, it's quite a sticky subject. It's quite heavy. So attachment theory examines our way of relating with others and the world. Trauma exists in relationships, okay? So it, this is a working model for relationships and it's about being seen, being understood and having our needs met. Okay, so attachment theory was pioneered and I always lead with the women in the past, either, women either weren't credited or came further down the totem pole, Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby. So please do some research on this if you are interested. It's also a very big subject. So I'll boil it down for you. There are four main attachment styles. 
you can have a read of this. I'll send it to you as well. But there is a secure attachment style there where the child is confident that the parents will be available to them. OK, consistency. The child will then be able to explore and go and master the world and know that they can come back and have their needs met. Even in a frightening situation, they can be often very responsive. And as adults, these children go into being bold people who can go and explore the world, okay in relationships and not too dependent. So, you know, often there's a situation given that two people can be in the same incident that may have happened in, um, in the war, right? When the, this is something I worked with, it was in the, when a tank had been blown up. And people think, you know, well, he's all right. And I've got PTSD. It's never as clear as that because you never know what is going on. But very often it, it comes back to having a, what attachment style people have. Okay, so secure attachment. You can read more about this when I send you this. The second one is avoidant attachment style. So as, the, as a child, the mother is not available for comfort and love. The child has no confidence when they want to seek care in relationship. It's actually safer to begin to look after ourselves. And they often attempt to live without love or the other. So they subconsciously believe that their needs will not be met. Um, and it's important for these people to feel very independent and self-sufficient. There's then anxious attachment style, which is where the child was uncertain if the parent would be available or responsive at all. So think about various reasons for this. Um, think about the, if the mother is, if there is addiction, alcohol, um, or personality disorders. So where this will appear as an adult is in separation anxiety. So this per, the child and the adult will may become clingy, clingy, clingy. And it may also appear in our work where in relationship, you may hear, well, if you leave me, I'm going to kill myself. So it's very anxious attachment style there. And the fourth attachment style is disorganized. So the mother completely unpredictable. There may have been abuse. The child may have been terrified. Complete unpredictability and quite erratic. Um, freezing may be the safest response to the child. Very confused about how the world is. So within the trauma yoga, this has been, this is factored in to why we do all of this talking and safety and all of that attachment styles. So the goal of trauma treatment, all trauma treatment, is healthy attachment, okay? Keep showing up, keep doing, be that person, be that secure attachment. Interestingly, and we don't have space for this today, the goal of yoga and more Eastern work is non-attachment. I'm just going to leave that in the space because the Buddha's mother died when he was three months old. I'm just leaving that in the space. That's a big conversation, okay? And also, we have neuroscience. So I've got a little brain in the break, right? Bit of Play-Doh that I'm going to use here. So as Bezel says, neuroscience research shows that the only way we can change the way we feel is be, by coming away of our inner experience, right? That interception and learning to befriend what is going on within ourselves. This is, think about the traumatized people we're working with safety there's no way we do not rush people with this okay but neuroscience research thank god now shows that the amygdala right so the rather than doing all the thinking here right like i've got to go to work do the thing write the report do the thing we stop thinking and when we become panicked and go to trauma the alarm bell that picture the amygdala that lives here right in the middle of the brain, right? The little pea size here, we fire from there. And when we do yoga, when we are able to engage traumatized people and trauma survivors into these, these tools, and it is tools, right? The amygdala slows down, calms 
down, bringing us back into our window of tolerance. Also, we now have research to prove that the insula in the brain, right? So it's just above the amygdala. Um, yeah, that calms down as well when we do yoga, right? Emotional regulation through doing yoga. It's not just yoga, okay? There are other, people might think, oh, bloody hell, I don't want to do yoga. There's many other tools now. Um, singing, drama, theatre, yeah, things, that other, other things. But for me, we have, and I can present you the research around yoga and why this yoga is safe to do that, okay? Uh, so ultimately, it's the limbic system, right, that exists within the brain. And this is a, he's, this is a wonderful man who's called Daniel Siegel, and he's going to explain a little bit more of what happens when we flip our lid. Okay, it's a lovely little tool, and I use this with kids a lot. One of the most rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up representing the wrist. And then you have coming up into the skull, the brain stem and the limbic area, which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, flight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brain stem areas. And the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lids. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all of that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child. And that's important to explain to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brainstem and limbic areas here and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lids. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go flip their lids and they need a break. They need a timeout. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. He's a lovely man. I would encourage you to look at some of his videos on YouTube and also some of his books. And I'm gonna to touch very, very quickly on these people who are leaders in what we're doing now, okay? So anything to do with mind, body, therapy, wellness, healing, especially in science, stands on the shoulders of Freud. And I run other workshops around more of the conscious and unconscious around this. Freud, Laura Pearls, Fritz Pearls, William Reich. Okay, so we're going back 100 years. And for, for the last 30 years, we've got Bessel van der Kolk, Pat Ogden. Great, she's got great books and that these people are doing good stuff online. Please look what they're doing online at the minute and do workshops with them. Peter Levine, Dan Siegel, Stephen Porges, right? However, for today, I'm going to leave you with something that all of these people, from what I've seen, do yoga, meditation, have been impacted by Buddhism. And if and we and I understand because I'm doing it myself, I have to lead with science so I can get this to as many people as possible, okay? So we need to write the papers. I need to do the research. At the minute, I'm working with Imperial University, Goldsmiths University, blah, 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 blah. Why? Because it impresses people, and then people want to write about it. And I'm teaching people about breathing in for four and out for six, 
Okay, so in the back of all of these people's books, right, the science, the this, in the back three chapters is what people have been talking about for 500 years before Jesus was born. Okay, and in the back three chapters, it's the same as in the yoga books. So this is, pick something you're interested in and follow it. But all of these people are impacted by what's in here, by, by Mr. Iyengar, okay? By a very important, I mention a woman, because usually it's all men, and a lot of them have been taken down by me too, is a lady called Vandra Scariavelli, an Italian lady, fantastic, okay? So these lessons, are very much, we need science to get them into hospitals, to get working in trauma centers, to again, be able to somehow tick a box like they do in, a, in the States to get funding and research and prove that heart rate goes down, okay? Very, very important. So some other people that I love and I would encourage you to do some workshops with now, or I'll come back to the vagus nerve in a sec, or Gabor Maté, I'm sure you all know about him. If you don't, he's doing a workshop, I think next month online. Loads of stuff on YouTube. Again, talking about the impact of childhood trauma on often addiction. Um, there also the work of a, a lady called Alison. Alison, I'll, I'll share our details with you. Um, Alison Priestman and Nick Totten, Wild Therapy. Again, this is grounding. So this is more therapeutic work. But if you're in, how do we begin to work in an embodied way outside? How can we bring wildness into the work? So Alison Priestman, she has a workshop. She runs many workshops online and Nick Totten for Bet Rothschild. Again, it's important that I bring uh, the women forward here. And before we go, we got a couple of minutes and we're gonna go into some movement. If there was one thing that I believe is the most important bit of language and knowledge we can start to talk about for the next 10 years with mental health not for us to talk about for us to talk to our clients about for us to get our clients to have access to this it is the vagus nerve and polyvagal theory people like in my mind people like to confuse it and make it quite difficult which is the opposite of what's important to me so that we it's awareness that at the back of our neck Right, there is a nerve that runs from here all the way into the major organs. It's actually part of that parasympathetic nervous system. You know, the cat, the lower one, it is the chief neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. The fibers go brain, body, brain, body, mind, body. The messages related to polyvagal, the vagus nerve, impact heart rate anti-inflammatory chemicals, and it's controlled by social engagement. This is where I'm concerned with people with COVID. Lack of social engagement, right? okay? Back of the throat. Um, it helps us regulate our emotions and regulate the fear response. So I'm gonna send you these slides and I'd love you to have a practice with some of them. But actually, there's various meditations. This is again where we've got polyvagal theory and people wanting to get caught up in the head and hang on, let's get well. These are tools for healing. We all know this is about healing. Okay, so maybe certain breaths we may use with clients. The humming breath. Mm -hmm. You may choose to join me now if you like and just mm -hmm. do this with kids, little bees. Mm -hmm. Notice, notice the vibration there. Also, it's something um, that works is the, by repeating the sound, voo, voo, voo. Again, I'd invite you just to notice the vibration there. Chanting, if that's your bag. Singing, you might want to put Beyonce on and or just or whoever and have a bit dance around. Singing, dancing, okay, talking. We need to stimulate here. Remember at the beginning, I talked about um, the three responses to trauma the four threes fight, flight, vocal, right? That failed us. Shouting for help didn't do anything, right? So, how 
how can we begin to bring it back? Talking, love and kindness meditation. Be creative, right? What understanding but by actually coming back in the here and now, there are other things we can do. Who is the lady with the surname Brazil? There was a lady. She... That's me. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't see, but I can hear you. So, yeah. you know, washing our face in icy water, jumping in the water. You were talking about jumping in the... Where did you jump in? In the sea in Edinburgh. Wow. And how did your, how did your body... What happened to your vagus nerve? Oh, for me, it's about for two or three hours afterwards, I'm so incredibly relaxed. It's so good. And I can sleep, which often is a problem for me. So it's really, really healing. Can only recommend. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So these, we don't have enough space and time. And maybe I'd, I'd like your feedback around that because I'd be quite happy to focus on the healing tools because I often have to start with the science to get us in the space. But we do this because people get well. It is healing. It is options that we can have in our toolbox. So we may still need medication or we may not need medication. Again, this is about choice to be well, to sleep, to move, to be in the here and now. Okay. And we all do this work because we know people get well. Okay. Lorna, can I just ask, please? Um, yeah. I'm a biopsychotherapist. A... I'm one of the people who's. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Zina. Hi. Oh, sorry. Oh, was that the video? I thought someone else was asking a question there. Um, the, with the vagus nerve, Helen's asking, um, does the... Um, uh, does a vagus nerve make more sense of the value of talk therapy on a somatic level? Yes. Yes. Because we're talking. And also, so there's a va so which is great. And even that can happen in person. Some of you will be, I'm working in person and online now. Phone, Zoom, anything we can do to connect anything we can do to connect and how we can start to share these tools. Yeah, so as a therapist that we actually give it to our clients to share the videos I'm sending you, I send them to most of my clients. So they understand and they'll say, wow, Lorna, I did this or I did this and this worked. That helps me. And then we share, because then I understand more what they've had to do. Like I've had clients who go to singing classes since lockdown and they do it on Zoom. I would have bet my house that these people would not have been on ever going to singing classes. So it's a vocalization of the vocal cords. Okay. But I'm assuming like, just in normal speech, you're going to get a bit of that vibration, aren't you as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And remember we'll get regulation with eye contact. It also works on the phone. And I'm sure you can do very effective. You know, other people are doing effective therapy on the phone as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's contact and vibration there and I think it also helps people understand why and actually Zina you mentioned once um that you knew someone and you know for a therapist just to say oh let's do some mindfulness and you'd say hang on I've got loads of stuff going on here why we need to understand the why do you agree Zina yeah yeah that's what so I, that I've actually had that experience the first time it was introduced to me in therapy without any explanation during a very difficult period mm. I, I wasn't letting that in but now I've learned you know I've that was years and years ago so I know why knowing why helps me it's not for everyone some people don't want to know and just want to do some people and I imagine with trauma mate this is you know more information you know for some people a reaction to trauma is needing more information of why they're doing this so it's it's yeah always to the to the individual but for me personally I definitely need to know why that it is going to reduce my heart rate that it is going to you know there's a science behind it there's a reason yeah yeah that's great and um, no, can I can sorry is it all right to offer to offer something is Lisa, Lisa, li literally I've just found this this morning and it was so powerful. So if it's okay, I can share it. On my glorious phone, the app Balance, I know there's Headspace and all the others, but the, the app Balance, and there was an option there for immersive sound. 
right? I live on my own. So like in the, you know, lack of hug and all the rest of it. This phone, in immersive sound, there was one that, uh, and it says hold your phone, but I was laying down. So instead I put it on my, on my chest. And the immersive sound was the sound, it, for me, it was the heartbeat. And it was, and it vibrates, the phone vibrates with the sound of the music and this, oh my goodness, it was, it was like, you know, everyone's anti-phones. My phone was my, was my joy this morning because it was going into my heart and it was like having a baby on your shoulder or, you know, having a really proper, decent hug with the heart to heart kind of, it's just beautiful. Honestly, it might not do the same for other people, but it was just absolute joy. I mean, it had tears, but it was through, wow, you know, I felt like someone was hugging me. I don't know if anyone else has done it, but it's just literally this morning. So I just wanted to share that with people really. Thank you, Alison. I love you've just shared that. Thank you. And would you mind putting the name of the app in the, in the chat? If, yeah, that, if, if you've got the, yeah, just yeah, share it, it, It's, Alison, you've put it in the chat, have you? I think of it, but again, maybe while you've um, explained it, yeah. It's yeah. the first thing I'm doing after this, by the way, yeah. Alison. That's just the first thing I'm going to do is download that app and find that. <laughs> it sounds amazing. So what, what you're doing, Alison, as you, as you know, you're, you are actually using, raising the vibration of your vagus nerve. And I've used this example before, but a client of mine, and I, you know, this is about four years ago and I was like, how do I bring this into client work? Blah, 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 blah. You know, getting all intellectual in my head. And then a client came in with a copy of the Daily Mail and said, right, what's long-term trauma client? What's this bloody Vegas nerve? Um, because I can save vouchers up from the Daily Mail to get something. And it was like a little thing that vibrated. Yeah. And this is where they'd also give examples of, you know, the humming, the app, all of, so let's keep doing this and sharing this. This is the num this is important. We get this knowledge out to the people who need it, not just keeping it for us to worry how we're going to say it, share it. Okay. So thank you for that, Alison. And the final part of the, the foundation of trauma sensitive yoga is Hatha Yoga. So for me, the Hatha Yoga is the sort of Victor the basic cake mix of yoga. There's many different types. But that's your basic, basic cake mix. Ha, ha, just which may be useful for people who aren't yogis. Ha, up, ha, energy, sun, the sun. Ta, lower. Let me just read this for you. Because we're going to do some in a second. And also, David Emerson is a Hatha yoga teacher. The guy who was Bezel's yoga teacher, Hatha. So it's the, the ha represents, it's a, it's a combination of two Sanskrit words. So the ha represents prana. In yoga, prana is energy, um, the vital life force of energy that exists in our body associated with the sun. So again, think of the sympathetic nervous system. People are depressed, they need energizing up. Hatha the represents mind. In Sanskrit, it's mind. Mental energy associated with the moon, okay? So I'm going to close the theory side off there and let's move. We've got, let's just do a 10 minute practice, some movement. And we're going to invite you to get on the floor, get in the space. And we're just going to move our bodies. Yeah, let's move. So we'll just take a few moments to come into a comfortable space on the floor. You don't need a yoga mat. I'm just going on the carpet. I'll still be here on the chat, by the way, if anybody needs me, I'm still contactable. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. So just coming into a comfortable seated position. Comfortable seated position on the floor, on your knees, cross-legged, whatever feels comfortable for you. And when you're ready, just let your hands fall to the floor. Just feel the earth next to you. Feel the earth next to you. And when you're ready, and if you like, just begin to raise the arms up. You may want to add a little breath here. You may want to wiggle your fingers, extending from the armpit to the elbow, elbow to the wrist, wrist to the fingers. And if you like, slowly bringing the hands down the center line. You can have the palms together or wide. You choose, you decide. 
And we're going to do this two more times. So feel the ears for the fingertips. And just notice here the points where your body's in contact with the earth. And you may wish to begin to bring the arms up again. And I'd invite you here to notice how you can create more space at the front of your body. So for me, I need to go a bit like a cactus, arms wider and extending from the armpit to the elbow, elbow to the wrist, wrist to the fingers. Maybe wiggle your fingers. Just notice if it would be useful to put some circles in the wrist. And if you like, and when you're ready, bringing the hands back down, down the centre line. And can we begin to slow it down, that movement? Connecting movement and breath. So, and just notice what happens when we begin to slow down. Usually there's a little monkey jumping around our shoulder saying, hurry up, got to do this, got to do that. Slowing down. And again, coming in contact with the earth. And for the final time, if you like, and when you're ready, bringing the arms up. Take the breath you need here, breath and movement, and slowly bringing it down. Can you slow it down to half speed? Just what happens if you slow it right down? Just experimenting with that. You have choice. You have choice. Okay. And coming in contact with the earth again. And if you like, and when you're ready, gently dropping the chin to the chest. And bringing the chin up to one side. You may notice the lengthening at the side of the neck and taking it back down again and up onto the other side. You may feel your body lengthening up. You may notice your body lengthening up. Continue with this. We do this two more times. Going up to one side. Just being curious as you may notice it's different on, the, on one side to the other. And sometimes we notice and sometimes we don't and that's okay. That's okay. So coming back to neutral. And if you like, you can bring one hand and take it to the other knee. Take it to the other knee and bring the other hand behind you as a bit of a, a totem pole that you can rest on. So we've got a bit of a lever going on. And if you like, I'm going to invite you to lengthen through the spine. And you, again, yeah, you may notice the body lengthening up and feel free to gently twist from around the belly button area and below, bottom of the spine, gently twist off to the side. And you choose, you control how deep that twist is. And I'd encourage you here just to notice the difference between keeping the eyes down and up. So you control where the eyes are and how deep that twist is. And again, notice the lengthening at the side of the neck, waist, and any tension in the shoulder area. If you're anywhere near an edge here, maybe just back away from it. And I'd invite you to try that on the other side. So you could try that on the other side. And really, before you move, you may want to breathe. And can you notice the earth? Can you notice the floor, the carpet, or the points where your body's in contact with the earth? And we're going to, I think, invite you to do this one more time on each side so in your own at your own pace when you're ready you have choice so you may wish to experiment you may want to push down on that back hand just be curious from one side to the other one side to the other excellent and coming back to neutral and if you like and when you're ready i'd like you to bring some circles into your shoulders circles into your shoulders and you choose which direction you want the shoulder to go which you want the shoulder to go and if you like and when you're ready I'm going to invite you to bring your fingertips to your shoulders and make some either big circles or small circles whatever feels right for you right now you may want to add a little breath for the movement okay moving and breathing Feel free to do that, whatever pace feels right for you. And if you like, and when you're ready, I'm going to ask you to come on to all fours, invite you to come on all fours. The knees are around hip width apart. Anything with the wrists that may be uncomfortable for you, feel free to go on to fists. 
and gently beginning to pull the chin into the chest, arching the spine, arching the spine, slowly letting that go, Bring, taking the gaze up and you may want to drop the mid spine, just checking in with your spine. So we'll do this three more times. So bringing the chin into the chest and you may want to add a little breath. Just noticing, do you want to connect breath and movement? Just being curious about any tension in the neck, mid spine, lower back. Noticing as your lower back speaking to you here. And can you do this? Can we be here and smile? and breathe and notice the earth that might be a bit too much so smile breathe excellent and if you like and when you're ready tucking your toes under i'm going to invite you here to push your hips up into a downward dog hips up into a downward dog and if you like, and when you're ready, walking your feet towards your hands and your hands towards your feet. So we're in a forward bend. And while you're here, I'd like to invite you to notice your feet. So you may want to wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers. Really squeeze the toes down and take the weight all in the front of the body. Back heels. Can you notice the middle? Where's the middle? And the middle's quite boring, but if you've been to the edges, that's why we... Like the middle, so coming back up, coming back up to standing. Feel steady. So do what you need to do to feel steady where you are now, feeling steady. So for me, I need to take the feet a little wider. Let the knees be soft, shaking the hands, shaking the hands, shaking the shoulders. Have a little wiggle, have a little move, have a little move. If you like, and when you're ready, we're gonna take three deep breaths again, inhale. Bring it down. Just noticing, you know, you can pace me. I'll use it. Go with your own pace. Can you connect moving and breathing? You can change something here. What do you want to change? You're not stuck. And final time. Take the breath that you need, a powerful breath. Engage, smile. Can we feel the floor under us? Bring the hands back down. Just shaking that out and coming back to that steady spot. Weight on the one side, weight on the other side. Find your middle, find the middle. Taking one foot forward, one foot forward, gently bending that front knee, gently bending the front knee. No need to take the knees over the big toe. And if you like, and when you're ready, gently bending for the front knee forward, taking the arms up. And how can you create more space at the front of your body? What do you need to change? I need to take my foot out a bit so I feel steady and my arms quite wide. Can we do this and feel the ground under our feet? Can we smile? Can we breathe here? Just notice what your body wants to do right now. Breathe and slowly release. Shake that out. And we go on the other side now. Take the other foot forward. Again, just find being steady. We're not on a tight rope. We're not doing anything fancy like whatever they do on the Instagram. Take, be steady, really steady. Engage the belly, sun. Imagine the sun on the belly. Feel the, feel the sun on the belly area. And if you like, and when you're ready, gently bend the front knee. And you may want to bring moving and breathing together. Do what's right for you here. I'd encourage you to take the posture that you, the form even, that you would like to take. Can we be here and breathe? Are you able to send your brain into your back heel? Just notice brain into the back heel. Belly button is areas active. Front toes. Find your middle. Can we smile? Can we breathe? Stretch here. Take the movement that you, your body needs right now. Exhale. Slowly release. Slowly release. I'd invite you to bring your hands together. Hands together. And if you like, and when you're ready, we're going to take three rounds of sun breath. 
Inhale. And again, you choose what your wrists and fingers want to do here. You may want to go further up, that's your choice. And when you're ready, begin to exhale, bringing the hands together. You can stay with me or go with your own pace. And we'll take another breath. Just experiment with squeezing the shoulder blades together. Notice any clicks, pops. Can we slow down that exhalation, activating the parasympathetic nervous system, bringing us down into our window of tolerance. And again, inhale. Add a little breath if you want. If you want to add a little. We always think we're full with breath and we can add a little bit more. And slowly, if you like, and when you're ready, bringing it back, bringing it back. And if you like, and when you're ready, we're going to plant one foot down quite powerfully, plant it down, plant it down, taking your weight into the front, the back, notice your middle. And we're going to bring the other heel above the ankle bone. If you would rather take the leg higher, go into the posture, the form that feels right for you right now. I'm going to stay at this lower option. You can take it above the ankle bone or higher. Whatever feels right for you right now. Bringing the palms together. Can we notice the soles of our feet? The toes on the carpet. Where are we grounded into the floor? Be steady. Be steady. And if you like and when you're ready, Keep the palms together or take the arms up to the posture you need. You may want to bring your arms higher or keep them wide. Chins parallel with the floor and you may feel your body lengthening up. Can we engage the smile? Can we smile here? Can we breathe? Can you notice the ground under your feet and be steady? And slowly letting that go. And we go on the other side. Plant it down. Just noticing as well, we'll be different on one side to the other, always. And it changes about every 90 minutes of balance. Bringing your heel into the position that feels right for you. Again, you can take it higher if you prefer. Take the posture, the form that feels right for you now. And I'd invite you to come into the posture, the form that feels right for you right now. Breathe here, can you breathe? Can you wiggle your fingers? Can we smile? Just feel free to breathe, smile, even move. Can we be like bamboo, moving, yet having a steady base? Again, you may feel your body lengthening up. And if you like, and when you're ready, slowly bringing the arms back down and coming back to feeling steady. And we'll take three powerful breaths together to close. You may pace me or take the pace you need. Take the breath you need. Slowing down the exhalation. Slow it down half speed. For the second time. Noticing the soles of your feet. Noticing the space in between your fingers. Slowing down the exhalation. And for the final time, notice the weight in your heels, the front of your feet. Inhale. Add a little more breath. Add a little more breath at the top. And slowly... Extending the exhalation, activating your parasympathetic nervous system. So just taking a moment now, just to come back into the space, wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, lick your lips, have a swallow, you may want to have a little drink of water. And we've got a few minutes left for questions. So we can come back into the space, make, keeping yourself as comfortable as you can. Maybe noticing the temperature of the body, what you may need what your toes need. And we've got a few minutes now before closing for any questions. 
just taking some and if you've got any questions oh just pop them in the chat and Zena, or you can un unmute if you prefer hi um lauren i just wanted to ask um that was great by the way i feel really relaxed now <laughs> that was good um uh, that focus on safety and people feeling safe yeah. uh, really comes through as that as, as a really as a really uh, big priority. But I noticed that you don't necessarily state you're safe. Is that is that an intentional thing? You're not kind of saying to to someone, "Oh, you're safe, you're safe," just in case they don't feel that way. Or what would you say about it's that? Not, it's not for me to tell somebody they're safe. That's for them and, for, and then to give them the space they need to do something about that, whatever that might be. Sure. It's not for me. When people say this is a safe place, and I think, really? <laughs> I don't think it's very safe. You know, so, so yeah, that's a really great question, Mandy. Thank you for asking that. Okay. Cheers. Yeah. Hi, Lorna, can I ask? Go, John. Hi, John, by the way. Hi, John and Ruth in Edinburgh. <laughs> Listen, I was a bit confused about the things like using coherence breathing, you know, I, I tend to use the two bells in yoga nidra, which has been almost sanctioned by the veterans associations in America for using with people. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, it's a kind of go-to for me with, with, with the classes that I teach. What's your thoughts on that? Because I, I use the two bells method for the coherence breath. Mm. And the feedback generally has been really positive, so I, I'm, I'm a bit confused about that, whether we, we do, do or don't use that. It's not for me, John, to say what you do and don't do. And I think for me, what's been useful to reflect, and it's to notice it and to reflect on it, John, so it's interesting that you've brought it. So for me, I and it's hard for me to take the bells and whistles out, because I like the bells and whistles, and it's also been interesting for me to notice where where I've got it wrong with the yoga nidra in a group and and that's where my learning's been that that's not okay to do it in certain groups um so I think it's interesting that you've brought it John I think it, again it's around safety and maybe maybe experiment with it what do you what do you think might be triggering around it or what 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 do you think I've actually had a, a, a bad response with someone where, where we were using Kabbalah and it, 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 you know, but that tended to be the, the more upward rising ones, you know, mm -hmm. so that, that, that triggers some kind of response like that, that people find, um, obviously, you can't be sure that everybody's feeding back to you or, or whatever, but I've never had a bad response to the, um, the two bells breath. I think some people find it hard to kind of to, to do the six six seconds each in and out. I think that can be quite hard for people. But once we get into it and once we know that they, they don't have to take a full breath, they can sit breath as well. I think it's a learning exercise. So yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I suppose there's a bit of trepidation for me to lose that from my practice, but it brought it into awareness for me. Ruth and I spoke about it. Yeah. during the break so I'm, I'm fascinated to learn what other kind of tools I might be able to use around that yeah um, so yeah. Can you go with that, John and it's really useful let me know how you go with that maybe let let me know yeah let me know because it's it, it's from a safety place it is real gear shift you know for me is it to hear oh my god they don't have blocks oh of course they don't have that oh the bells because actually in, with it depends on the group you're working with and actually some of the, the people, many of the people have told me back that they've just completely disassociated and lost it and had psychotic episodes, you know, when they've gone in too much to the third eye and they're up and they're up and they're up and they're up. Um, so yeah, so it's just useful that you've brought it, John. So keep noticing and let me know. Yeah, I will do. Thanks, Bye. John. Lona, um, Alison's just asking if you do any more classes for therapists and or um, clinical supervision. I'm not a supervisor, but I do run other workshops, Alison. So keep an eye out and I'll, I'll pop you on the mailing list for other, other work. And again, all the 
if you have this interest already, please use it. I know Charlotte, you got that book. Can you put the book up to the screen if you've got it at hand? Get that, but if you're interested, read that book. And I know something, and I have to assume if you're on the course, you'll have the energy to buy the book and read, get the book. And it's about noticing, it's not right or wrong. Whereas actually some of this stuff is quite directional. How can we begin to integrate these tools into our work as therapists or people who are working in classes with people or in heal? It's about integration and noticing. So, and then again, like John's just then, just bringing that to awareness. Oh, I might question this because this is how we all learn as well. What was the book, Lorna? Oh, Charlotte, have you got it there, the book? You can't see Charlotte. Charlotte's in Australia, I know she's miles away. <laughs> Over I'm just going to type it in the, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm just going to type it in the chat box, so. Yeah. That's the book, John. John, get that. And it's a lot about um, veterans as well. And I know you work with a lot of veterans. So Lona, there's a lot in there about that, John. Lorna, sorry. I, I hope I haven't, earlier on, I put another one of his books in the chat. Was I right in thinking the white cover one was for therapists? Yeah, spot on, and then, So, and that was yeah. the right one I put in. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So any other questions before we wrap up? I know there's loads. I'll be sending you too much information to read, a reading list that you'll never get through. And if I can encourage you to pick up a couple of threads and follow them up, we've smashed it. Okay. Any other questions before we go to a quick check out? And... Can I ask one? Of course you can, Melanie. Um, I'm really, really interested about, I've been to a couple of workshops now about embodiment and yoga sensitive work. And um, I'm just wondering about sort of next steps of training. So I work as a therapist and I do lots of breathing and I try and bring in some grounding. But I just, as, as you made reference to earlier, obviously as a therapist, being a bit more concerned about, oh, how much movement can I use? I'm not, I haven't got any yoga training. So where are my limitations and boundaries as to what I can use and, and, and do with people? And, 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 and to, to, to even take that forward, next steps for sort of training. Do I need to do a yoga uh, teacher training, sort of foundation course, or one of these trauma-sensitive yoga courses? I, I, I'm wondering what's the best way forward. I'd say read that book, Melanie, and also yeah, you have that, that in... David Emerson one. <laughs> um, follow your interest. And a lot of it comes with a lack of confidence because basically you'll only ever need really three simple techniques working with a client, right? You might do that, you might do that. Yeah, we might do that Not with some of the techniques. If you want to be a yoga teacher, so I've worked with some people on here. So is she give us a wave? You are now a yoga teacher, right? So she's, is she went and did it because she, she's gone that path, yeah? yeah? And other people, so it's knowing where your gut is and also having some confidence yourself about notice Melanie, what clients have come to mind now that yeah. actually think, yeah, they're, they're already maybe doing something like this. Yeah. So it's okay. And, and actually I'd, I'd encourage you to build your confidence, Melanie. Okay. To just start doing it and start it with seated. Watch the video that we did at the back. We did yeah. a few minutes at the beginning, just shoes off, steady the breath. That's, a lifetime's worth there. That's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Keep it simple. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Oh, you're so welcome. Wonderful. You're very interested and uh, uh, amusing to to watch. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Now. It is. Sorry, I think it probably didn't come out right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, everyone. I just wonder if we could all. We're going to wrap up now. So just as a check out, if we could all unmute and. If possible, if you can reach it. And first of all, I want to say happy birthday to Laura. So happy birthday to Laura. If you would join me in shouting happy birthday to Laura. Happy birthday. Lovely. Thank you all. <laughs> and I want to thank you all for your interest and passion in being here today. And I also want to give us all a round of applause for that, just to shift the energy. And uh, a round of applause for Zena, who's kept us all on track. So thank you, Zena. Oh, Great job. <laughs> Zena is the founder of Counselor Staff Room, a very inclusive space on Facebook. 
so you can find that there and she's a wonderful lady doing wonderful things and yeah I just need to ask you now just to notice if anything's come up for you today who you may need to take that to to keep yourself well where we all are at the moment on this in in lockdown right now really notice what you need now you're probably all starving right what do you need now and be mindful what might come up for the next few days if you have any questions get in touch i'm going to send you loads of information and your certificate and all of that but thank you for your interest go and spread it go and do it go and do it we've got some a lot of people that we need to go and heal keep well and share these tools so please stay in touch and enjoy the rest of your day.